What we're seeing in recent years is that there has been a significant escalation in the scale and the nature of illegal trade in wildlife. Uh, you know, where historically you've dealt with uh, subsistence poachers and, and people that poached for their livelihoods, um, that we don't see anymore. We see deep involvement of organized crime in illegal trade in wildlife, uh, syndicates with well-developed networks that corrupt officials, um, networks stretching between continents that are usually well-resourced. So we're definitely not dealing with uh, small-scale subsistence poachers anymore. We're dealing with serious transnational organized crime. So this is really the main, the main source of uh, disappearance of these species then? Yes, I think if you look at the large-scale seizures, the huge quantities we see when you start up talking about tons of pangolin scales, tons of ivory, um, you can't move those quantities without well-developed networks and involvement of organized crime. Um, so I think these are clear indicators that we are really dealing with, with serious crime. And how big is this business then? I mean, in, in dollars or francs? Well, CITES itself doesn't place a value on illegal trade in wildlife. There's various estimates, some estimated between 5 and 10 billion US dollars per annum. Others estimated between 5 and 20 million billion, uh, uh, 20, excuse me, 5 to 20 billion US dollars per annum. So um, it's huge. It's huge, but it, and it ranks right up there with, with other serious crimes like trafficking in drugs and trafficking in humans. I, I think in reality, um, criminals often make more money by uh, by being involved in wildlife crime than they do in by, by being involved in other serious crimes. Are there some areas where you see uh, more activity than elsewhere that are more worrying to you? Especially with regards to the high-value CITES listed species. Um, those are the ones targeted because at the end of the day, um, these crimes are crimes of greed. And um, wildlife is just another commodity through which these criminal syndicates or that these criminal syndicates target to conduct their um, illegal business. Um, I think in short, you could say if it can make them money, they will target, them, they will target it, it, no matter what the consequences are. And uh, this is what we see. So the most targeted species are your high value species. Um, we see iconic species uh, being targeted, elephants and rhinos in particular. But also, um, mostly if, if you look at the World Wildlife Crime Report that was released in 2016, um, illegal trade in timber species is uh, very significant. What are some of the main causes for this activity? I mean, and what role does this corruption play also in it? I think what happened is um, the serious nature of wildlife crime escalated very rapidly in recent years. And in many countries, our national legislation didn't keep up with that. So um, the penalties that could be imposed for wildlife crime really didn't respond to the serious nature of the crime. These uh, syndicates make so much money that they can very easily pay fines, and especially if it's a low fine. Um, I think what's very encouraging is that we are currently seeing a global collective effort to deal with this issue and we already saw many countries recently revising their national legislation uh, dealing with these issues and we see very strict penalties being imposed now for wildlife crime in many countries and, and that's a very positive sign. You talk about 25, 30 and more years in some cases for, uh, for offenders involved in, in wildlife crime. And those are the kind of things that you need to, um, to deter these type of crimes. Um, we're also looking into issues like um, anti-money laundering. Uh, and we currently have a number of programs that we deliver um, on fighting anti-money laundering. We, for example, have a, a consortium, which we call the International Consortium on Combating Wildlife Crime. That's a collaborative, collaborative effort between the CITES Secretariat, Interpol, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, the World Bank and the World Customs Organization. And through this consortium, we put together our unique pool of collective expertise to deal with these issues. And one of the products that a consortium, uh, for example, developed is an anti-money laundering training program. And with this, we train our authorities to look into the money side of things also, because that's where you really hit where it hurts, um, when you take these organizations money away from them. And I think that's a crucial part of, of addressing wildlife crime, is to really mobilize the tools that we also use to fight 
other serious transnational organized crimes, also in the case of wildlife crime. Um, corruption that you mentioned, corruption of course in the environmental sector is, um, is there, just like it is in, in all other sectors. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a reality that we're dealing with. We currently also, under the auspices of IQIC, uh, for example, developing guidelines to mitigate um, the risks of corruption in the wildlife trade chain. Um, at our recent CITES Conference of the Parties that was held in Johannesburg in 2016, a dedicated resolution was adopted on corruption which gives uh, guidance to our member states on the measures they should implement to, uh, to combat corruption. So uh, corruption is a serious issue, it's a reality, uh, but there's also a number of activities ongoing to deal with the issue. I guess the issue probably in many cases is that of enforcement of these regulations that you mentioned. Yes, I mean it's one thing to have good legislation, but that's quite meaningless if it's not being enforced. So I think it's essential um, and that's also what we're promoting in the countries that recently revised their legislation is that they really um, engage in efforts to make sure that all authorities, national authorities that have a responsibility to combat wildlife crime, that these authorities are well aware of legislation uh, and that they're actually actively working to implement it. There's also a lot of work going on with the judiciary and prosecutions to also um, strengthen capacity there um, to deal with the issue. When it comes to actual seizure of, uh, of these um, illegally trafficked uh, items, how much are we seeing annually right now? Well, it's uh, difficult to give you a figure on, on annual quantities. Um, what we have since uh, our last conference of the parties is an annual illegal trade report. The first of those have been submitted by our member states in 2017, last year. And we're currently working with the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime to uh, analyze that information and to compile the data into a report, which will also give us a better insight into the quantities we're talking about. Uh, but we do see huge quantities. Uh, for example, if you look at Elephant Ivory, we have a system that has been tracking quantities there um, over a long period of time. And uh, in several countries, you see seizures of, of several tons at a time and added up, it, um, it adds up to significant quantities. The issue of cultural affinities. I mean, in China, uh, ivory is considered to be a bit of a status symbol, yet it was only this year that a full ban on uh, elephant tusks has come into force. How do you deal with these sort of uh, cultural affinities, especially in a country where their black markets might be somewhat of a legacy? Well, I think it's important that the public must be informed. And probably one of the, the biggest causes of um, illegal markets is uninformed uh, people. And uh, this goes not only for Asia, it goes for Europe and, and all the other continents too. This is really a global problem and depending on the commodity, um, there's, you know, there's a market for every type of commodity on every continent. Um, in Europe, for example, we see um, reptile trade and pet trade as uh, one of the big things. And I think that the big challenge there is um, the public buy and consume these things because they simply are not aware. And, and uh, so what we're doing, or what's currently happening is there's a lot of engagement, especially in the countries that's highly affected by illegal trade in wildlife, um, to educate the public, to educate the youth on illegal trade in wildlife and its uh, economic, social and environmental impacts. Um, we also have under CITES since our last COP a dedicated resolution on demand reduction um, that asks our member states to take um, dedicated efforts or to make de dedicated efforts to uh, implement demand reduction. But of course, that's, uh, you don't change beliefs overnight, so it's important also for these undertakings to be long-term and sustainable undertakings so that you can uh, really create a shift in, um, in consumer mindsets. President Donald Trump's two sons are rather enthusiastic hunters. <laughs> Uh, who were, have been photographed taking, picture, uh, taking pictures of themselves with uh, endangered species. Uh, and last year, actually, the U.S. administration 
had loosened its um, regulations on the import of elephant trophies. How has uh, those how have those moves affected you, and has it also affected your funding? I think what's important to realize is CITES is, is a convention that's not pro or anti-trade. CITES, CITES regulates trade, yeah, and the, the convention currently regulates trade in more than 36,000 species of animals and plants. And um, a lot of that trade has great benefits for conservation of the species, it has benefits for local communities, and so forth. So. Um, a lot of these things happen, but actually bring benefits to the species. Um, like I say, we're not pro or anti-trade. Uh, I think the key thing there is when you engage in such activities that you make sure you engage in activities that's legal, sustainable and traceable and well regulated. Um, as long as it's legal, there's no problem. The problem comes when, when you talk about illegal and unregulated trade. That's where species are negatively affected. What sort of support have you gotten then from the private sector? Well, like I said, there's um, currently uh, quite a significant global effort on the way uh, to deal with the issue of wildlife crime. I think um, what's very encouraging is that this issue has really um, came onto the political agenda in recent years. It's got high level attention and that also got the attention of, of the private sector. And we, for example, now have what's called uh, or we see things like uh, the United for Wildlife Transport Task Force, which is an initiative uh, from uh, uh, the UK, where um, you have a number of airline companies um, which are actively working and educating their employers to be on the lookout for any wildlife crime related crimes and to convey that to the authorities, basically being the eyes and the ears of the authorities. We also saw very recently a coalition being formed uh, between internet uh, companies um, to also address illegal online wildlife trade. Companies like Google, Instagram, Facebook, all now working together to look at commodities that's being illegally advertised and to removing those advertisements. Um, from our last uh, site scope, there was a number of decisions, for example, on cybercrime. Uh, one of these decisions, uh, or, or one of the decisions that came out of our last standing committee, which was um, held here in Geneva last year, is there was a working group formed on cybercrime, which, which are looking specifically at the issues of illegal trade in wildlife online. What is the role of Switzerland in fighting this, uh, this trade? How active has Switzerland been? Switzerland is our host country and is actually very active inside these issues. Um, Switzerland is one of our member states that uh, financially contribute to the activities of the Secretariat, supporting also our work on illegal trade in wildlife. Um, but Switzerland itself also has done some significant work uh, also in the context of uh, Tibetan antelope, where Switzerland, for example, did a lot of work uh, on the identification of illegal chateau shawls and um, bringing together a workshop uh, together with Interpol last year. And um, all of that, again, fed into the decisions that went out to our member states. I understand that uh, there was amongst the biggest seizures of chateau sh uh, shawls here in Switzerland. Yes, that's correct. Uh, and I think that's, um, you know, a good example of uh, where the authorities became aware of these things that were in circulation and actually took action. To, to address it. How much do you work with other organizations? Like I say, through uh, the International Consortium on Combating Wildlife Crime, we very deeply engage with, um, with uh, Interpol, the United Nations Office on Drugs of Crime, the, the World Customs Organization, the World Bank, but also others like IUCN, which uh, work very closely. IUCN, for example, very recently did two studies for us, one on turtles and tortoises and one on uh, pangolins. Um, we work with uh, the NGO community, WWF, Traffic. Um, Traffic is currently doing some work for us on demand reduction, which will also feed into our next standing committee. So I think it's, uh, it's all about, um, it's well recognized that no country or agency can tackle illegal wildlife trade alone. We must all work together and um, there's many different pieces to the puzzle. You know, you can't enforce your way out of it. You need to look at the enforcement, it's crucial, but you also need to look at things like livelihoods 
uh, you need to look at um, ecosystems and the environmental impacts. And so I think it's important that you bring the collective skills of all these different agencies together to address these issues.